Hi folks, this is uh, Richard Hall and this is uh, our night sky. Uh, of course, uh, I don't always do these things on my own anymore. I've got other people with me. There's, uh, there's Kay's there. Say hello, Kay. Hello, everybody. And we've got that other bloke with me as well. Yeah, <laughs> <poor Keith. laughs> hello there, I'm Keith. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you didn't know, Keith is uh, one of our renowned musicians in the wider Rapper. Okay. Uh, also, I always like to thank Dan Broughton, who sponsors this program. Anyway, we're looking at really the last of the uh, the winter stars, and um, it is. Although they might tell you on TV it's spring, it's not. Spring starts with the spring equinox, which is later on in this month, all right? But uh, we we'll talking a little bit about the spring equinox later on. So let's start by looking, have a look, having a look at our our night sky at the moment. Starting off always by looking to the south. There's the, the Southern Cross there, laying on its side as it does at this time of the year. Right? And that always gives you a good orientation to where, you're, where you are. Right? So there's Southern Cross there, followed by the two pointer stars which follow it around the sky. So it's dead easy to pick, and the, the brighter of the two pointer stars, of course, is Alpha Centauri, which is the nearest star beyond the solar system. And in fact, it consists of a binary system of two suns, are very similar both of them to our own sun and we now know uh, that they've all got planets around them as well that's what mm. we discovered with big telescopes yeah. a little while ago i um, finally managed to get my bresser telescopes a german uh, telescope properly aligned get the get the thing sorted out so i could f look at alpha centauri and you can actually just see the separation of the two main mm. stars that mm. make it up it's a it's an amazing sight and even even a smallish telescope will, will separate the two that's stars right, yeah yes yeah, yeah. okay so that, that's looking to the south but i mean most of what i want to show you today is is in the north so we turn around well i say turn around you turn around but then look directly overhead and we've got the scorpion can you see the scorpion up there i'll bring it up okay there's the scorpion there and the brightest star in the scorpion. You can see there's like a big hook of stars there. That's the heart of the scorpion. That's Antares. And when we, when we look at the, the stars, um, they're not the common star that you see in the galaxy. They're mostly the stars we can see are giant stars, and they shine out over great distances. Mm. And Antares is a, a really good example. Mm. It's an absolutely colossal star. It's what we call a red supergiant. Okay? Well... This star is so big all right, that if you put it where the sun is, we'd be inside it. All right? <laughs> it's that it's that large. It's bigger than yeah, the yeah. Earth's orbit. That's right. Yes, and it's as, as Monday, it's sixty five thousand times brighter than the sun. Most of that energy, incidentally, is in the form of infrared. It's what, once upon a time, this was a, a hot blue star, and it's expanded into red supergiant. But one of the things you'll notice, I'll get, have to get Keith to have a look at, and to, when you get it just right, you can see it's also got a companion star, mm. and it's got a bluey star, green star. And it always appears green in the telescope, uh, in this... I think is in contrast to Antares. So that companion yes, star is pretty much like what Antares was once. Yeah, probably, probably Antares is probably a little bit bigger, but when you, it looks small, doesn't it, that star when you see it, but it's actually considerably larger than the sun and a couple of thousand times brighter. Okay, mm. yeah. It's just that Antares is so much bigger it's again. It's absolutely huge, That's yeah. Right. And Mate. the reason why it looks slightly green is simply because of the dominating orange-red light of Antares. Mm, that's right, the yeah. contrast effect of it, yeah. Okay, so that's it. Its distance from us, incidentally, is 605 light years yeah. so it's some considerable distance away from it and as you can see there its diameter is 800 times that of the sun right yeah so that's antares and antares is easy to pick because it's so bright even you will see it's got this orangey red color that you can yes. notice all right now in addition to the scorpion we've also got sagittarius uh, two of them crowding around that central part of the milky way and that for those of you watching this this bright star I've brought up a little red star and that's marking the direction of galactic center all right and mm. we're going to have a look at that a little bit more in detail later on but just to pick out some of the other bright things in the sky first uh behind sagittarius of course we've got this um horn of stars it's dead easy to pick out folks you'll see that in the sky and the horn 
is pointing. That's actually first. I should point out that's part of the uh, constellation of Capricornus, but it's actually pointing towards another bright object, which is the planet Saturn in the sky. <laughs> and uh, unlike the other objects in the sky, because Saturn looks like a planet, and that's the word planet actually means wandering star, because that's what our ancestors thought they were. Unlike the mm. other stars that stayed where they were. These things wandered around, and Saturn's one they of them. To, they, they drift amongst the background mm. stars from night to night. Mm. Yeah. But it is the most magnificent object you can look at through a telescope. <coughs> it really is. It looks unreal, first of all. And it's got these magnificent rings, but of course, what we also know is that um, all the other giant planets, Jupiter and Uranus and Neptune, they've also got a ring systems, but they're a lot fainter. A lot mm. of those other ring systems are quite dark. Yeah, but the other thing that we know is that the ring system of Saturn is actually quite young. Mm. And it is believed to have been caused by the collision of... Because Saturn's got 82 moons, more than any other planet in the solar system. And two of them were believed to, which were made mostly of ice, were believed to have collided together. Uh, mm. A relatively short period of time ago. When you when you think about it having a lot of moons and it being a very big planet, and then you think about Jupiter, it's a wonder Jupiter hasn't got rings. Well, it has got rings, but they're, they're dark. Mm. Yeah, but mm. that's what I say. They don't really show up Saturn's, like Saturn's. Yeah. Saturn's rings are made of ice. I like to think that um, at one stage Saturn had 84 moons, but he decided, oh, I don't need 84 moons, I'll get rid of two of them. Well, but look, Jupiter's ring is made uh, primarily from sulphur from the um, moon Io. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? As Io mm -hmm. orbits the planet, mm -hmm. it replenishes this very faint sulphur ring around Jupiter. Well, these collisions occur while the, also the giant planet uh, uh, absorbs or attracts other objects in asteroids and so on. They don't tend to stay around Jupiter because no. they're either yeah. a lot further out or they've <clears throat> basically yeah. ended up being part of Jupiter. But it is still amazing that this one just happens to be the right size and have yes. enough moons for it to have these beautiful rings. Yeah, and for those of you watching this on TV, it says there, opposition August the 27th. Opposition means when the the, su the planet is directly opposite the sun, which is at that point, this planet reaches its closest point to the Earth. Mm -hmm. And that is always the best time to observe it because the yes. planet is its closest. So it's that nice and big in the telescope. That's right, yes. yeah. Yes. yeah. Uh, Saturn is often looks very good all the time, but other planets, particularly Mars, for example, it only really looks very good on or near opposition, which only occurs every two years. Or yeah, but you've like got that. more chance of seeing um, features on Saturn. Not that it, you're looking at a hard surface, but the cloud-like features that look like Jupiter. But what you notice mm. most of all over the years, of course, the orientation at which we see Saturn changes. Mm. So... Uh, Looking at this picture on there, you've got this, it's sort of tilted, which you can see the rings very well. But on a certain occasions, as it tilts back, uh, the, the rings just become a thin line. And sometimes, on the when you get directly opposite, it looks like, well, mm. they virtually disappear. Yes, okay, all right. Howdy doody, mate. Howdy <laughs> that's what we look like when we're on TV. The other stars. <laughs> Yeah. Well, let's see where we are. Oh, let's see that one there. There we are. Okay. <laughs> now, what I've done is pulled up a um, a photograph of the Milky Way, actually taken from Stonehenge, and you can begin to see that how awesome this object is. This region, it comes directly overhead. And from here, in the wire up on a good clear night, well away on my add from things like uh, blue moons and full moons, mm. when it's nice and dark, right now this brilliant region of the Milky Way is coming directly overhead, and it is absolutely awesome. And right near centre is a celestial kiwi. Now, can you see the kiwi? <laughs> I'll bring it up for you. Yeah, you've got to look for the beak. There he is. Mm. <laughs> That's a celestial. The beak is the giveaway. Mm. Mm. Yeah, once you see the beak, you can see the rest of the kiwi. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I will add, it's only in New Zealand that it's called the celestial. Yeah, kiwi. they're called asterisms, aren't they? Because they're yeah. not the internationally recognised constellations. Yes. 
Yeah. yeah. So but, you'd have a Kiwi in New Zealand, but you're bound to have something different in another country. <laughs> yeah, the Australians have a celestial emu. Yes. Yeah, which that's they right. See, yeah. Uh, well, it looks they like a Kiwi. Yes. <laughs> but, yes. Anyway, it looks a little complicated at first, and this is always a problem when we look at the night sky, is that we've got no idea the distances of the different objects and so on and what they are. The bright region of the Milky Way is simply vast numbers of stars right so distant that they cannot be seen individually what we're seeing is the combined light of many stars right and we see the milky way because we're looking along the plane of the milky way galaxy which we're mm. part of right mm. uh, the, you'll see all those black reg regions al along the center there which are originally believed to be holes in the milky way they're not <laughs> they're simply vast dark clouds of cosmic dust and gas which are simply blotting out the light of more distant stars and they become visible simply because they're sitting against the the milky way but on the other hand most of these dark clouds of course do exist along the the plane yeah. of the galaxy. And the other giveaway that they are dark clouds is those pink patches where they've got starburst regions. A absolutely. You've got to have fairly yeah. thick cloud which well, starts to condense down to do that. That is the raw material from which stars yeah. are formed. And st yes. all along there you can see star clusters, clusters of stars, because stars are not born singly, born in clusters. And what happens is a region of that cloud will collapse under gravity then fragments and creates a <laughs> cluster of stars. I think I've got some pictures here some of them. Here we are in that region there, the Lagoon mm. Nebula and the Trifid Nebula, all right? Yes. And you see this, as Kay has mentioned, when the big bright stars, you see when, when the clusters form, it's always the giant stars which have formed first, and they always are very hot blue stars. And the ultraviolet radiation from those stars energizes the, those clouds and which then give off light and yeah. so it turns the infrared. And the clouds light up yeah. yes so from the ultraviolet we're seeing invisible light yeah. okay so that's what you're looking at there the different colors represent different elements don't they so yes. you've got hydrogen and yeah. then yeah, the pink oxygen and things like that the give pink them different comes colors mainly from hydrogen yeah. Right. yeah. Well, often, uh, yeah, it also depends on what type of star we're looking at. So, so if you've got a very hot star, as I just mentioned, the ultraviolet radiation ionizes the gas, which then re emits the energy, but at visual wavelengths. And that's often mm. the pink stuff that you can see. But you also see blues and greens. And sometimes that's simply what we call a reflection nebula. It's reflecting the light of nearby hot stars. Yeah. Yes. So that would be true of the blue patch around yeah, the Trifid right. Nebula, yeah, which yeah. has got a, a red circle kind of an yeah. end. Yeah. Right. Well, if you look very close at Trifid Nebula, you've got these black lines. And in fact, it's a, they're shells of matter that have been blasted upwards. It's like a, looking down, a, as it were, a crater in the sky with a hot star at the centre Yeah, there. when you look at it, it looks like a ball, like it's yeah. round. But yeah. you've got to get your mind yeah. around the fact that it's actually a hole. That's right. Yeah. Some mm. of that blue... Uh, may well be what they call synchrotron radiation, yeah. which was simply masses and masses of electrons, free electrons, blown off by the star, but being curved, uh, being made to curve in their trajectory by a uh, by the uh, star's magnetic field. Mm -hmm. And when they curve round like that, you get uh, they they emit light, mm. and that's where that eerie blue colour comes from. Well, we get exactly yeah. the same thing as said to some degree with the. When you get solar activity hits the Earth's magnetic field, mm -hmm. and we get auroral lights and things yes. like that, yeah. yeah, here you're seeing those sorts of things, but on a on a grand scale, as it were, <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. So that, and there, I've just brought the star that's marking galactic centre. Now we can't see the centre of the galaxy simply because of all the stars and dust and gas clouds, right there, yeah. uh, but. We have got a really relative good idea of how far away it is. We've been able to measure it with radio telescopes and others, which can peer through it. And there's a very, very powerful radio source emitting from the centre there, mm. which is known as Sagittarius A. It's got a distance of 26,000 light years, right? And that is galactic centre where that sound is coming from, all right? Now, it's not aliens, incidentally, if you're wondering, it's making those sounds. So, with, as I said, with space telescopes looking through different wavelengths, we're able to peer to some degree into, the, into that region beyond that, which you can see at the moment.
So going inwards here, we begin to see this inferno of material beyond the, the stars that we can mm -hmm. see. Galactic centre actually is in that white spot there, right? Intense amount of radiation, and we're going further still. And as I say, here we get to absolutely inferno occurring. Mm. And finally, we're going to get down, and we find vast numbers of stars. We get near the core. Now, near the core of the, of the galaxy, there's a swarm of 10 million stars within a radius of three light years from galactic centre. So within fact, there's a swarm of 10 million stars. Now, let me put this in perspective. That right? would fit between us and yeah. um, Alpha Centauri, If we it? take a radius yeah. of three light years from the sun, uh, we've got a total of four stars. Yeah. In that same volume, we've got 10 million. So <laughs> can you imagine what it would appear like there? It'd be yes. pretty, pretty bright. I say so. <laughs> there would be no night on any planets around those stars. No, I don't think no. you'd want to live around a planet yeah, around those yeah. stars. There would just be a mass of stars. That okay. um, powerful radio source that you mentioned coming from the very centre of the galaxy, it's so powerful that it w that was literally one of the first things ever discovered when um, Karl Jansky built the first world's first radio telescope. Mm. Um, it was a very primitive radio telescope, yeah. but the radio source coming from Sagittarius A is just so powerful that even his primitive yeah. uh, telescope That's could right. pick it up. I mean, you're talking about 26,000 light right, years. Yes. This is telling you you've got something really right, powerful yeah. there. And okay. that's the first uh, inkling we had that there was something really, really exciting going on yeah. at the core of the galaxy. It looks yeah. like a shell, doesn't it? You know, you've got all those blue stars that we can see quite easily and a few red ones. And then you've got what appears to be a kind of a shell around yeah. that, that area. Yeah. Well, we're looking towards galactic centre, and if we peer in close enough and go right the way into that, of course, what we discover... Ah, Richard's favourite. <laughs> what lays in this... <laughs> <laughs> Falling down a black hole. Yes. <laughs> at the centre of this our galaxy, and now, we, of course, we do know at the centre of a very large um, galaxy there is a di titanic black hole. Now the big one that's at the centre, and this is where this is where all this radiation is coming from, it's stuff that's interacting, not coming out of the black hole, because nothing comes out of the black hole. It's mm. near the surface of stuff that's matter that's clashing and crashing and so on, that's sending out these radio waves. Now, as you see there, uh, it's got a radius of 44 million kilometres, all right? Mm. Uh, so, Looking at it, really, it would occupy the space in between the sun and the, uh, uh, occupy out to beyond Mercury, right, on our world. But in the inside that volume where the black hole is, there's four million solar masses, another four million solar systems. Hmm. And, and it's actually the, where that energy is coming from is that it's actually continuing to devour stars and planets at the rate of about a solar system per year, right? Yes, yeah. and as as the stars get swallowed, as it were, by the black hole, they emit all the uh, as all they this, all this, as all this they drop down in. Yeah. That's right. Yes. So that's that Titanic. But when thing. it swallows solar systems, it doesn't necessarily get bigger in size, does it? No, no. Yeah, no. I mean, you think you think of anything in our ordinary world, you know, a lump of clay or something. You add a bit more to it, it gets bigger. No. But in this case, it doesn't. Gets, gets crushed it gets crushed a bit. So yes. the black hole still looks the same, well, if you want it, yeah. you know, occupies the yeah. same amount of area, yes. but in actual fact just has more mass. Uh, and it will look, a black, what's inside a black hole, of course, will always be theory. And does it pick, it, does it pick up you know another <laughs> one every year, does it? Uh, yeah, it, about, on average, about one uh, solar system ca star comes near it. And that's what this image here is 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 uh, portraying, because it's actually an artist's impression. But what will happen is that if you start, the solar system got too near to it, the sun and the planets will be broken up into a, 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 just a, a mass orbiting mm. around the black hole, and it would then gradually spiral inwards. Yeah, but if we went backwards then, one solar system a year, and it's 44 million... 4 million solar masses. So 4 million years ago, did it form 4 million years ago or did it exist before then? No, we're pretty certain it, it was observed. It, 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 um, 
the black hole will have formed in the very, very early stages, and that's why you've got a Milky Way galaxy. Early stages of the universe, you mean? Of the formation oh, of the Milky Way galaxy. galaxy. Okay. And, and because of that, then other matter and stars around it got attracted to it in the great spiral system, which spiral around that central spot. Every galaxy, they think, has a black hole, massive black hole yeah. in its centre, yeah. and that black hole is the origin of the galaxy. Yeah. Anyway, yes. I think it might be good if Keith could play us a little tiny tune right now <laughs> to the black hole. How's that? Yeah. Well, I'm still learning to play the flute. I'm getting better at it sometimes. <laughs> Thank you, Keith. <laughs> and uh, it's a, we, we'll, we'll have a discussion about black holes and other things like that at a later date. But they are the most weird and wonderful things because they turn everything on upside down. Uh, here, for example, outside a black hole, you can only, in time, you can only move in one direction. Inside a black hole, you can move backwards and forwards in time, right? Yeah. And all sorts of weird and wonderful things happen inside them, right? It's almost as though space and time are reversed. Mm. In, the, in the normal universe, we can move at will in mm. space, exactly, but we have yeah. no control over time. Inside the black hole, we cannot move in space, we're, we're stuck. Mm. But uh, we can move backwards and forwards yeah. in time. It's, yeah. it's, it's absolutely <laughs> peculiar. <laughs> All the laws of physics break down yeah, yeah, at the singularity yeah. at the centre yeah. of a black hole. Anyway, uh, don't think about taking a trip to a black hole because <laughs> once you go in, you can never get out again. All right. right, nothing can. Okay, so that's that. That's a big titanic black hole that's at the centre of the galaxy. Now, as we travel down the Milky Way, uh, following down, uh, we see lots of bright stars. The brightest underneath the, the Scorpion and Sagittarius is Altair. All right, which is in the constellation of Aquila. All right, and Altair is a relatively close star. Okay, it's just under 17 light years away. It's a white hot star, but it's also rotating very, very rapidly. Uh, with some suggestion, it's actually planets are in the process of forming around it. All right, that's Altair. This one's called the Great Chief from the North yeah. in Mari. Um understanding because it's actually very far in the north to us yeah if yeah. you look at you've got to look north and look closer to the horizon mm -hmm. to be mm -hmm. able to see the star and so it's the great chief from the north because if you go north of course where you know the maori people came from it's much higher in the sky yes absolutely mm. yeah and these are the all these stories of course are telling you something if you know how to unravel them aren't they that's you know, right it's telling yeah, you about yeah, yeah. about your latitude really Mm. So uh, there's there's that's Altair, which is a white star. To the in the northwest, you'll see a very bright star. I think it's about the fourth brightest star in the sky. It's Arcturus. It too has got an orangey red colour, and the reason for that is what we call it is what we call a red giant star. Mm. Right? But interestingly enough, although it's a because of its size, it's so big, it's 170 times brighter than the sun. Its mass is only slightly larger than that of the sun. Right? And I think yeah, I'm going to bring up an image of the sun, but now I'm going to bring the sun to scale, to Arcturus. There it is, like that. <laughs> now, but the interesting thing is, we know once upon a time, 
Arcturus was a star similar to the sun in size and mass. And then as it's consumed all of its hydrogen, it then began to, it's, it, the nuclear furnace began to accelerate and so it began to get larger and larger, all right? And it turns into a red giant. Our sun one day will turn into a red giant and when it does so, it's too, its brightness will increase at least a hundredfold. Yes. It's really so that, bloated, isn't it? Oh yeah, that's right. So this, but the very fact that this star is in this stage, it tells you it must be a hell of a lot older than our sun, which it is. So that's Arcturus So we've got, there's a red giant. Now quickly looking along the horizon, almost due north is the bright star Vega. It is a mm. northern star. It only comes up above the horizon here in New Zealand at this particular time. Now Vega is interesting. It is a, a white hot star, 25 light years away, uh, all right? And um, it's 37 times brighter than the sun. It's about twice as massive, all right? So that's Vega. And its age is only 455 million years, all right? Which you might say only. That's a short period in the age of a star, mm. okay? Anyway, what I wanted to point out is next to Vega, it's, it, Vega incidentally is part of a um, const small constellation called Lyra. And in the Lyra, between the strings of the Lyra, is the Ring Nebula, all right? Let's bring that up. There it is there. So what happens is when the red giant star dies, it gets so active, the energy blasts it, all its outer layers into space. And that's exactly what we're seeing now when we're looking at the Ring Nebula. And it is the debris of what was once a bright red giant star. And those rings of different colours are different elements, aren't they, that it's blasted off? That's right, yeah. As it's been running out of fuel, it's burnt the last elements it could burn. Exactly. Until yeah. it collapsed. There's an enormous but we can ring there. So and so the, you've got this this ring nebula, all right. Now the ring nebula is uh, two and a half thousand light years away, all right. <laughs> uh, but it's a magnificent object actually again to see in a small telescope. It's very pretty with that it blue is. centre, but isn't it? But don't say, hope you're going to see that in your small telescope. This is taking... Is that little white dot in the middle, the actual what's left of the, the star? What's what left, yeah. Let's have a look at that. All right. mm. This photograph incidentally is taken by the James Webb Telescope. OK, we'll bring it up there. Remaining at the centre is the white hot core of the star, uh, which is essentially a diamond the size of the Earth. Yes. And every teaspoonful of this matter will weigh thousands of tons. So although it's cooling, it's not going to be a very nice place to mm. go. It's what we call a white Don't door. try and be too greedy and mine it because you'll end up spread out like raspberry jam, wouldn't you? That's right. <laughs> it, it, the gravity it is, is too, too It intense. is essentially yes. a stellar corpse, yes. okay? Yeah. It's, it's a dead star, all right? And eventually the nebula will evaporate into space and all we'll have is this core. And which that'll will, cool, won't it? Which will gradually cool and dark. Dark and over you won't dark. be able to see it. So yeah. there's probably heaps of them out there. Yeah. Oh yes. I would say mm. there probably is. Yeah. Anyway, having said that, we should mention some of the things that we got out at Stonehenge. At the moment, we're open from Wednesday to Sunday, from ten o'clock to four o'clock in the evening. Uh, we're closed on Mondays and Tuesdays. However, we'll be open any day or night for private bookings. If you want to have a come out and have a special guided tour of the Henge, then you you need to phone in to us. All the heavens. Yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. I'm going to mention that in a minute. So you can have a you can phone up for a guided tour, all right? And uh, or in the evening to do a star trek when we take you around the stars, mm -hmm. picking out the bright stars that are in the sky at the moment and so on. Yeah, when I got up last night. Orion was sitting outside the kitchen window. I'm sure he didn't yeah. worry about our kitchen window, but it was just looking out those windows. He yeah. was right brilliant there, mm. yeah. as he is above and the that, tea and trick. That, is our sign of summer, mm. which brings us into the fact that we've got the spring equinox is going to occur, uh, and we've got a special presentation on the actual day of the equinox, which is starting at five o'clock on Saturday, September the 23rd. And we're gonna have all the special stories about the equinox, what it's all about. Hopefully, if it's nice and clear, we'll be able to take you down to the Henge and you'll be able to see the sun set on the special stone that's there marking the equinox. And incidentally, it's exactly the same in stone circles around the world. On this mm. particular day, it, the stones will mark exactly where the sun sets at the yes. spring equinox. Okay? Well, not the spring one, but at an equinox. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, 
Yeah, spring and autumn are the two days when it sets. And yeah. The sun rises east and sets west. But spring west here and, so, and autumn yeah, in the northern right, hemisphere. Yeah. And mm. as I just mentioned at the beginning of this, this, of course, is the, uh, the beginning of spring. That's why. And yep. Despite somebody saying, oh, September is, it's just, a, that's all made up. Okay. Yeah. That, <laughs> that equinox, that is officially when spring yeah. begins. Anyway, folks, yes. uh, we're going to have to shut up now because our time is up and. Um, Look forward to catching you up in the near future, all right? But do come along to Screen Equinox. If you want to do that, just give us a phone, give give Stonehenge a call, and Kay will book you. You can in. book in through the booking system too and through Event Finder. So there's our booking system and Event Finder that you can book in through.